All righty. Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> um, last week we did some history on it and uh, to kind of give a little background of the book, I think we all know what's going on. I think most of us have probably studied uh, all of this stuff already. Uh, there are some weird things that I've been thinking about and finding and we'll kind of go get into that a little bit to some things to think about as we get into the book. Uh, one of the things I always question is, uh, you know, why is God, why is he dispensing this book? Why is he saying the things that he's saying? What does he want us to know? And I think the easy things are there, you know, concerning sin. That's always there and those kinds of things. But I like to put it into the context of who they are at that, at that point. And, you know, how does that apply to, to, apply to us today, which the applications typically don't change. People don't change that much over time. That's probably my bigger point. We might get less superstitious, we may know more things, we, you know, we may have a lot more information, but when it comes to our relationships to God, with God, uh, things don't change a whole lot. So uh, before we begin, let's have, a, let's have a word of prayer. Holy Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that you have uh, given us this day that we can study from your word, and we're so thankful for your word that you have given it to us as a great gift. Father, we ask that you would be with us during this time as we look through it, that we would put it into our lives and into our hearts, and we're so thankful that you have given us your Son. We love you so much for that, and we love you. We love your Son as well. These things we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, so I, here's what I wanted to do before we get into all of this stuff. Uh, I think I've got it all lined out here. I wanted to just read a few verses about the people, where they came from, and, and who the things that were happening, starting in Exodus. And you, you don't need to run there if you, if you don't want to. That's fine. Exodus chapter 7, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Uh, this, is, this is God talking to Moses. He says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. And you read that and you kind of automatically realize that here is a group of people who have faith in God. They have this faith that they're carrying. They're telling their children, God can save us, and they have this, uh, they're praying to him, and they're asking, uh, well, I'm assuming they're praying to him and asking him to come deliver them. And so that kind of strikes, you know, that strikes the reader right away the first time you read Deuteronomy or Exodus without knowing the rest of the story. You think, this is a great, faithful bunch of people. And then we start finding out what faith really is, and I think that's what Deuteronomy is really about, is, uh, you know, you may, we may think that uh, we're faithful and that we're calling on God, but, it, you know, that entails so many things in our lives, you know, uh, you know, with the things that we're asking for. So, really quick, uh, I wanted to read from Jeremiah. This is, this is something that struck me. In Danny's study, when we when uh, when I read it again, which uh, you know the last time I read it, it's been a, been a while, and this struck me as to the condition of the people we're talking about now. In chapter two of Jeremiah, God says through Jeremiah, He says, uh, chapter two, verse two, go proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me, and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. 
All who devoured her were guilty, and, dis and disaster overtook them. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness? So here's God in Jeremiah citing the condition of these people. And he's kind of saying, you know, you were pretty good back then uh, because you were relying on me and it took 40 years to get there. So I, I wanted to say that as well because there's some conflicts to that. Uh, there's conflicts to that statement. By the time we get to chapter 9, uh, we see Moses saying, uh, you know, you people are really stiff-necked. <laughs> and he, you know, he accuses them of being stubborn and stubborn-willed and all these things. And so we, there's, there's never this parody of, of uh, the level of faith uh, kind of matching a specific perfectness that we would love to see. It just never happens. And that is another uh, story within this story that there's always going to be these other issues. And uh, as much as God loved them during this period, because this is about as good as it's going to get. Uh, there's some other good times that we see where people are doing well, like in the time of David and things like that. Uh, but by and large, uh, there are issues. And when you get to Joshua 24, and this will be the last thing I wanted to do as the introduction. When you get to Joshua 24, where Joshua's dying, it's, it's uh, I, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get a definite date of how many years Joshua spent before this was over. It was anywhere from 50 to 70, 80 years, something like that. Kind of hard to say. But it says in, in chapter 24, verse 19 through 29, he says, through 25, he says, you are, not able, you are not able to serve the Lord. He's warning them. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn away and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But, but the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. So here, uh, so here just, the, you know, in those days, a, a half of a lifetime or so, we see that they are again, you know, they have idols in their homes, and this is a constant issue. And we look at that back then and we say, yeah, well, you know, the, the Israelites, they had real issues with, with idolatry. But that's not a message to the Israelites. That's a message to us. And I, we all know that, that anything that we put above God is the same as an idol. It's, it's uh, you know, anything. Money, uh, covetousness, all of that. So that's, those are kind of the, the kind of things that are floating around in my head as I'm reading that God loves them. Of course he loves him. He even appreciates that they've come a long way since, you know, the 40 years ago and all of that. And, uh, and, and yet, it's never going to be perfect. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go through, I'm not going to read through, uh, through it and then go through it again because it's a very long reading. So, uh, Basically, the main point of chapter 1 is, of course, Moses is opening up his dissertation to the people. And he opens it with, uh, with some history. And that's what we're going to go through today, are the different, the different history points 
that Moses thinks is important to, to go over with them. So verses 1 through 5 will cover the first three questions that Brent has in the book. So let's, let's read verses 1 through 5. Now I have, uh, I have the literal version that uh, I found on eSword e e recently. They, they came out with the literal, it's a more literal version of, of the Hebrew. And uh, it's very readable though. Starting at verse 1, these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the, beyond the Jordan, in the wilderness, in the Arabah, opposite to Suf, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Harazoth and, Diz and Dizahab. Easy for me to say, not. <laughs> Eleven days from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And it happened in the fortieth year in the eleventh month, on the first of the month, Moses spoke to the sons of Israel according to all that Jehovah had commanded him concerning them. After he had stricken Sihon, or Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Adriai, who happened to be one of the giants, Anakim or something like that. Okay, so there's that first little bit of history that Moses lays out for them. And the first question is, how long does it take to get from Mount Horeb, Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea? And uh, which is, that was a staging location for the, for the spies uh, uh, for the first generation, Numbers 13.26. And how long has Israel spent in the wilderness? So there's a couple of answers in there. So how long does it take to get there? He says it right there in the, in the verse. I'm trying to read your lips, Robin. Did you, did you say 11 days? Yeah. It takes 11 days to get there, and I think the main point is uh, probably ended up taking them a lot longer. Um, verse 2 says it takes 11 days and uh, they make it there from the time of the exodus from the time of the exodus to getting to um, to that area it was about a year a little over a year the law was dispensed at Sinai during that time and uh, so so, so there, here, how was how long has Israel spent in the wilderness? Well, I'm assuming he's he's talking about this crowd and not the crowd who made the initial journey. He's talking about this crowd, and so he's just putting a time frame on it because it's important. Where uh, remote, where it's written that it was the. 40th year, let's see, verse 3, in the 40th year, so they've been out in the wilderness for 39 years, and they are in their 40th year, in the 11th month of that 40th year. So, in the first of the month. So, in order to complete 40 years, they've got two months to go. Moses spoke to the sons of Israel. So, that's how long they were in there. And According to that, what time marker is this? Anybody? Why, is, why would the 40 years be important? If you were wandering around, why would 40 years be important to you? <laughs> Anybody? I couldn't imagine wandering around for four days, a little long 40 years, but... <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, Mark, I think it's it's because is it because it's a full generation of people? It is a full generation of people uh, in in the sense that the fulfillment of what God said was going to happen is ha has happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a certain generation that God was not happy with, and, and that's it. Uh, in Numbers fourteen. Um, 
for 34, God tells them they will wander 40 years. So they're told in numbers, you're going to wander 40 years, one year for every day that you were spying out the land. So if you were there to hear that as a young person, because your parents are going to die likely, more, more than likely, in, in, in the desert, this 40 year period is almost done. What do you got, Dick? What do you got, Dick? See, it does seem. <laughs> well, one of the things that struck me is being out there, first off, the, tr the distance uh, traveling to Horeb, they travel only typically on a camel. It's only about three miles an hour, so they're out there a while. You know, just those 11 days, I'm like us jumping in the car and driving 11 days. Right. You know, it's very, very slow. Right. So, the other thing, being out in the 40 years, um, I think that with really make them uh, have to rethink and, and think about the uh, their banishment from the wilderness. Uh, that long of a period of time is going to be very, very, uh, I don't know, it's going to affect their hearts, I think, about the apostasy and uh, the rebellion right. and all that junk. So, uh, I don't know, that's what, that kind of thing, being out there that long. You got it because it's not you're not moving around fast, you know. You're moving around slow, and you right. you really either don't think of it or you do think of it. So that's it. I'll like Well, that's it. That's right. Uh, and we d we did talk a little bit about this last week. It, when they were in this time period, uh, again, God is building an army, and when you look at the way He forms them, they kind of surround the heart of of the camp which is God that makes sense and God doesn't do that for no reason because he should be the center shouldn't he and then on top of that during after they they mess everything up with, with the spy incident that the following generation watches the rebellion uh, we see people getting swallowed up, you know, by the earth. God does some miracles. We, there's a plague that comes down on people. And so, uh, you know, they are really being, um, uh, I don't want to say they're being tested because I think they understand what the test is um, eventually. They're just being trained. I think God is training them. And I, that's why I brought up what I brought up earlier. The, the training is not cry out to me whenever you need me. And I'm not saying God isn't, doesn't say that. But he's also saying understand what that means for me and understand what that means for us. You know, we talk about having a relationship with God. That relationship isn't us just crying out to God every time something happens to us and thinking... He's going to take care of it, and I don't have to do anything. He'll just do it. That's not the case. And if there's any evidence of that, it's this right here. Because as I said earlier, they were crying out to God with, you know, obviously with some great passion, asking God to come deliver them. And uh, he says, I came down to do that. And so, you know, we see God coming down. Uh, we, you know... It, when you think about God coming down, I think about God coming down. I think about Jesus. Uh, so in that sense, you see the parallel. Uh, but, you know, the difference between this group of people and the group of people that Jesus develops, uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference. There is still a great amount of faith that is required by us, and that is exhibited and manifested by the things that we do. And I think we're just lucky, uh, blessed, I would say, that we do not need to go wander around in a desert for 40 years. So the fulfillment of those, the fulfillment of the promises are at hand for these people. Uh, you know, imagine if you were 10 years old or 20 years old, you're now, you know, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, apparently what they had done up until that time was time served. Uh, towards that 40 years 
So, you know, if you were 10 years old and you saw these things, you understood that there was something about God that, that needed attention that your parents didn't take care of. And you are the guy who has to do it or the, or the woman who has to take care of it now. And now you're, you're 49 years old or you're 59 years old. Say you were uh, 19 and you know, so you would be, you know, 58, whatever. And, uh, and, so, and so they're looking for that fulfillment. It's kind of like when they were looking for the fulfillment, fulfillment of the 70 years uh, of, uh, before they were released. Okay, so that is, that's the indication for, for this group of people. They're listening to Moses. They know that something's close. They have to know this if they, if they could tell time at all. Okay, so what is the purpose of the book, and what is Moses declaring, and uh, is it just a restatement of the laws given in Leviticus and Numbers? So what's the purpose of the book? Did anybody get an answer for that? I mean, certainly he goes through, you know, what we know he ends up going through a bunch of these laws and things like that. Is that the purpose of the book? Anybody? Well, you know, again, I think I, I put myself, I would try to become one of those people who watched my mother and father die in the desert. Why is God doing this? Why is he saying these things to me? You know, why Mark. is... Yes? Um... I didn't necessarily get it out of these verses here, but um, to me, the purpose of Deuteronomy is to give them a decision. They need to make a decision. And he's going over the history of the people in the wilderness and the things that God has done to them, the... Uh, legal system that's been enacted, uh, how he's taking care of them, what they've gone through, and he's, since they're in the Transjordan, they haven't gone in to take the land yet, and he's giving them a choice, because he's giving them the land. A lot of times we think of that, oh yeah, you know, they took the promised land, but God gave it to him, them. Right. It was an act of grace. Right, amen. And their proper response to that is obedience. And so in this book, he's going to tell them what they are going to be doing. And it's not just a reworking of all those other laws. And how their attitude should be. And, of course, famously in the end of the book, He's going to have them recite what will happen if they follow him and what will happen if they don't. So the decision for them is to choose life. Exactly. Exactly. I, I'm in complete agreement with that. Dave brought that up last week, to choose life. And that little passage that I read of Joshua, he kind of does the same thing all over again where he says, you know, I don't think you can, he basically tell, he, he kind of, I don't want to say he baits them into saying anything, but he's kind of testing them and says, you know, I don't think you can really, I don't think you can, uh, you can be God's children, you know, you, I don't think this is going to work. And they say, oh no, we want God. So he, and this is also something that we talked a little bit about last week. To your point, look at Moses. Wow. You know, here was the guy who was like, ah, oh, I don't know. I don't know, God. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, I, I have a really slow, and I'm slow to speak, and I'm just not really good. And here he is, after 40 years, <laughs> he understands this, the importance of what's about to happen next. He's not going to be there. And the best thing he can do is get people up to speed in what they're agreeing to so that everybody's clear on the conditions <laughs> and this is I think that's something else that 
that uh, makes me think about, you know, we, we like to talk about God loving us unconditionally. And he does love, that love is always there for us to access. But that doesn't mean that we're in a relationship with him. Uh, his, his, the, that relationship has conditions. We can't just ignore God in every aspect of our life and then just, you know, kind of what the original people did, cry out to him when we need him only. It's not how it works. So yeah, I think all of those things, there's very good points. This is a legal system. And, uh, and, uh, and on top of that, uh, it's a legal system that is the importance of which is the spirit of why God is dispensing it. It's not just uh, something that uh, you do and then you're okay. It's something that is supposed to lead you somewhere. Anybody else want to throw anything in there as a, what the purpose is? I think that's an excellent way of putting it. It's, he's getting ready to ask, tell them, what are you going to choose? What are you going to do? Uh, Mark, I was going to... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Tom, Tom and then <laughs> Wendy. Tom and then Wendy. Okay. Um, I was just going to add, um, I like what uh, what Ida was saying about the choice. And yes. I think, um, uh, again, we it's, it's not in the first chapter, but going back to chapter 6, where he really defines the essence of the law as saying that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength, and which is referred to in the New Testament as well. Right. Um, uh, as a call to Israel to be sure that they keep their focus on, you know, why they're following these laws, which is because of the love of the Lord, not just to tick off, you know, the boxes, you know, that, you know, that they're just completing a set of ritualistic rules. Um, and so that's something unique in Deuteronomy, because I think that's the only place in the Old Testament where it says, you know, the the essence of the law to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength. I agree. And when Jesus said that, it was kind of a mind-blowing inc incident because it wasn't one of those other big laws that you saw. Like it wasn't one of the Ten Commandments. You know, what's the most important commandment? He goes to something that was kind of uh, they were probably thinking was secondary, and you know, I, you know, they, they, you know. It wasn't one of these big, gigantic laws necessary, you know, like the Ten Commandments. He went to the heart, if you will, of what the law was supposed to do for the person who is blessed by it. Wendy. So I just, two other things that I felt were important. One, that he, in the whole beginning, is building up their faith because they are about to go in and, and face nations. And... Uh, the other thing being that whenever later we see new kings coming in, uh, they were supposed to read the law periodically. And um, I think that was this was something that Moses was doing almost ceremonially to show them this is something you guys need to continue doing. You need to remind yourselves of the law. So I'm going to do this and show you how to do it right. Okay. It, it, it actually is a command to them uh, formally to do that every seven years. And it makes sense. And, and that's why it's such a big deal when later on when the kings come, they find the law and they go, hey, maybe we should read this. <laughs> and and this, is the, this is who we are. This describes who we are. This describes the God who we, we say we, fo we follow. But I'm also in complete agreement that this is a building of the faith, and he's, and he's doing it by going back and talking about, these are the things that you've seen, and these are the things that you've experienced with our God. Uh, let's not forget that, um, which, you know, that's, you know, everybody knows the application there. It's very easy to, to lose sight of who we are. Uh, that's pretty much all I had as well. You know, he's 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 showing God's sovereignty. Uh, 
Yeah, this is, the, I had it written down, this is the covenant generation. It's really unfortunate when you think about it. Um, you know, after 400 years that people just, they forgot about the level of faith uh, that God wants us to have, wanted them to have. And that, you know, after Abraham, uh, it took about that long for things to go south. Um, that's about all I had. I can't add to anything anybody else said. So let's read verses 6 through 18. And uh, the question is, what story is Moses retelling? And what is he highlighting? So 6 through 18. <clears throat> 6 through 18. Jehovah, our God, spoke to us in Horeb, saying, you, you have had enough of dwelling in this mountain. Turn and pull up stakes and go into the hills of the Amorites and to all its neighboring places in the Arabah, in the hills and in the low country and in the Negev and in the shore of the sea, the land of the Canaanites and of Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River. Behold, I have given you the land. Go in and possess the land which Jehovah has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their seed after them. And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself. Jehovah your God has multiplied you and behold, today you are as the stars of heaven for multitude. May Jehovah the God of your fathers add to you a thousand times more than you are, and bless you as he has spoken to you. How can I by myself bear your pressure and your burden and your strife? Give wise and understanding men and those known to your tribes and I will, appoint men, I will appoint them rulers over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have spoken is good to do. And I took the chiefs of your tribes, wise and noted men, and I gave them to be rulers over you, commanders over thousands, and commanders over hundreds, and commanders over fifties, and commanders over tens, and officers for your tribes. And I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear between your brothers, and judge with righteousness between a man and his brother and his alien. You shall not recognize persons in judgment. You shall hear the, the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid because of the face of a man, for the judgment is God's. And the thing too hard for you, you shall bring near to me, and I shall hear it. And at that time I commanded you all the things which you were to do. So what is Moses retelling here, and what is he highlighting specifically at this moment? Did anybody else get Exodus 18? That's what I ended up with. <laughs> Exodus 18 is the, after they had left Egypt, Jethro comes down, uh, Moses' father-in-law comes down, and he is visiting. He brings uh, Moses' wife and his children, and he's visiting with Moses, and while he is there, uh, he notices that Moses spends the entire day resolving disputes between the people. And he, he literally says to him, what are you doing? <laughs> he says, Moses, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm helping the people. You know, they bring me their problems and I, and I help them. And he says, 
He says, uh, this is not good. No, 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 no. You need to select people to take care of these issues. And if they can't take care of it, then they can bring it to you. So that, I thought this was the story that he was talking about. And, uh, and so what is Moses highlighting about it? Why would he even bother to bring this up? Any guesses? I, I mean, that's all I'm doing is guessing. <laughs> I don't know that there's any wrong answers to this unless it's really crazy kook, kooky. Uh, Mark, I, I think it might... <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Thomas. <laughs> did I beat you to the buzzer? <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, well, I was just thinking that um, he's highlighting partly the importance of government, that you have a hierarchy of power. Um, so you can't have, you know, um, a society structure where you just have one single individual that controls everything. There, there is kind of a chain of command, and, and that goes back to the dispensation of government that um, you know God gave in Genesis. That's just a thought I had. Okay. Same idea. Same idea. Yeah. Okay. He's just talking about the chain of command that uh, that he developed. I think it's interesting that... Go ahead, Dave. No, go ahead. You can comment. Well, I just think it's interesting uh, that it was a... It, it took a Cushite to make this happen. It wasn't... You know, Jethro wasn't even one of the tribe. Well, what I took away from this, one of the things, important things, I think, is how they wanted to stay at Sinai and God wanted them to go and enter the promised land. Now that reminds me of Galatians 3.24 where it says the law was a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. So here's the problem. How are you going to do what God said if you don't do what God said? You want to just stay stationary in a place. That's what kind of popped out at me. Um, you know, he, he was specific about that. That to not make Stay there. Go into the land. But right. I promise you, you can multiply in, you know, in, in, in his plan. But I, I find it baffling, uh, you know. And I think we can apply this today that too many of us as Christians want to stay at Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> that makes any sense? No, that's totally convicting, isn't it? it? I think that speaks to the idea of not getting too complacent of where we are. We talked. We did talk about that before. That uh, you, you know. God may ask us to do some very uncomfortable things, and that's kind of the life of, of the Christian, of anybody who believes in God. And, you know, that, that is a, can be a test of our faith. Or we could be more like Abraham and just say, okay, that's what I'll do. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think it's interesting that he's delegating. He, he talks about delegating. I think there's uh, other things he's talking about. He's he's the he's the one who did it. He's he's he un, not unlike uh, Paul is talking about you know if he's doing the delegating, what does that mean? That means that God has given me some authority here, and this is what we need to do. And so it's all of the that we we were just talking about with. Thomas was talking about this idea of government, this idea of there being a hierarchy. Um, although uh, God warned them about what was going to happen when they get a king, and they were smart enough not to look for kings when they get to the when they get to uh, the promised land and it took them a little long it took them a while before they got to that they they were okay with the the judges uh, they weren't okay but they were okay to have that be their system um, I just yeah that's that's their starting point I think that's the starting point Moses is saying, "Here's our starting point. You know, we left, and then, uh, and then we, we went. We left to have our law dispensed to us. 
a lot of things happened during that time that were, were as established for tradition as well, including the Feast of uh, Weeks, where uh, you know it took them you know seven weeks to get to to Mount Sinai and get the, the law dispensed to them. <clears throat> so I think that was an overriding thing as well that he was showing his authority. Anybody want to add anything else? Lauren, you need to unmute. This is kind of a small side note, so I obviously uh, agree with what everyone has said here so far, but it also stuck out to me that right in the beginning of verse 6 and 7, he's reminding them of, um, uh, reminding the people of how God has fulfilled his promises to them, or what he gave to the patriarchs and then to them in turn. Um, apparently I'm having issues with my mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, if you want to type it into the chat, that'll work too. So, um, well, and that, that, actually, that what little bit I did here, it it uh, it it kind of extends what Wendy was talking about. He's building their faith. He's reminding them of what God has done, and you know, there's there's really no better way for us to re, you know to remember what we base our faith on than to remember how God works for us. Okay, um, you go ahead and if you want to type something in the chat, we'll, we'll get back to it, don't worry about it. Uh, so, the next section is 19 through 33, and I think we're going to cover that and then we'll stop there. <coughs> There we go. The purpose of the book goes along with the purpose of the book, as we discussed earlier, to lead Israel to obedience and to warn them against disobedience. Yeah. The spirit and, uh, and aim of the law is explained in such a way to present both encouragement and warning. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, the whole thing about the law is... Um, the one law that uh, Thomas brought up and the one that Jesus brought up was one law that won't convict you of anything. <laughs> the only conviction going on in there is the conviction that you have for the love of God. Uh, the, all these other laws that we talk about are typically things that, that happen or things that address things and when we do something wrong, if you will. Okay, verses 19 through 33, what is Moses retelling? And what is, he what is he highlighting about God? And what is he highlighting about the people? Verse 19 through 33, let's read that. As we pulled up stakes from Horeb and went through all that great and fearful wilderness which you have seen, the way of the hills of the Amorites, as Jehovah our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come into the hills of the Amorites, which Jehovah our God <clears throat> is giving to us. See, Jehovah our God has given the land before you. Go up, possess it, as Jehovah the God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be afraid. And you, and you came near to me, every one of you, and said, Let us send men before us, and they shall, they shall search out the land for us. And they shall bring us back word as to, as to the way in which we shall go up, and the cities to which we shall come. And the thing was good in my eyes, and I took twelve men of you, each one for each tribe. And they turned and went up to the hills, and came into the valley of Eshcol, and searched it. And they took of the fruit of the land with their hands, and brought it down to us, and brought us back word, and said, The land 
which Jehovah our God has given us is good. And <laughs> you were not willing to go up. Yea, you rebelled against the mouth of Jehovah your God and murmured in your tents and said, Because of Jehovah's hating of us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorite to destroy us. Where shall we go up? Our brothers have melted our hearts, saying, We have seen a greater people and taller than we. Cities great and walled up to the heavens, and also the sons of Anak. These are the giants. And I said to you, Do not be terrified, nor be afraid of them. Jehovah our God, Jehovah your God, who goes before you shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in, in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have been <clears throat> where you have seen how Jehovah your God has borne you as a man bears his son and all the way which you have gone until you have come to this place yet in this thing you are not believing in Jehovah your God who went up before you in the way to seek out a place for your camping in fire by night to show you the way which you should go and a cloud by the day so uh, so <laughs> Moses brings up <clears throat> brings up some uh, some history they may not want to hear again uh, although uh, none of these people who are hearing it were were found guilty before God at that moment and I just wanted to add really quick, I, I talked a little bit to Robin about this. In this version, he talks about the people coming to him and talking about going to do this spying. And when you read it in the, uh, in the account, in Numbers, it just says, and God t told Moses to go. So we must extrapolate from that that the people made the request and Moses must have taken it before God and asked him about it and God said yeah go ahead and do it uh, I, I tend to believe that God probably understand understood that it probably wouldn't go well but I don't know you know I can't know everything uh, but so so that's the story. The story is about when they went up to spy out the land. They see some nine-foot guys walking around, <laughs> and that scares them. That's the bad part. But they also see, you know, people walking around carrying, you know, you, you, they would like get a stick and then put produce on it, like, like, a, like a grapes that were freshly picked, and they're so heavy it takes two people to carry them or whatever it was. And you know this the land flowing with milk and honey so they saw this great land but they were also very much afraid of the people that they saw the Anakim specifically um, so what is Moses highlighting about God and what is he highlighting about the people is the question but it's the people who have already died Mark. Yes. Um, your your version. I didn't like the way it read <laughs> <laughs> because it's mine literal. Says, mine says. What verse? Uh, verse thirty one. And in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son. Yeah. Yours says said born. And yeah, I thought, it's like bearing somebody. I know, but carry just sounds so much sweeter. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I carry, but you know, there's another way of saying that. I had to carry you guys throughout all of this. <laughs> so, so no, I, it wasn't like that. I don't that. think that was God's, that was not God's statement. I agree. This was, because because he says it right there, as, 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 you know, as a man bears his son or a father bears his son. That's, I mean, that the implication there is a father and son relationship and this goes all the way and we're going to see this throughout this whole thing this goes right to what Wendy was saying about faith and what Thomas was talking about about uh, 
things getting right to the heart of things. God wants his people to look at him like he's a father who has a kid on his back. Is that what you're saying, Robin? That's kind of, you're right, and that's where he's driving all of this. You know, God is a great God, and this is how he wants you to rely on him, like a young child would their, their, their own father. That's a good point. What, what is he, but what is he saying about the people? <laughs> Specifically about the people who fell in the wilderness. Just to, I, I want to keep that up front. This isn't about rebellious. Yes. This is rebellious. Yeah, there is. And the, fearful. Yeah. Um, exactly. Fearful. They are very, very fearful, and it just you know just didn't matter what they saw God do. It didn't matter what they saw Him perform. Uh, you know, he whipped up on uh, on Pharaoh. We just finished that study. He whipped up on Pharaoh, and that I, I, I mean, and then they wa went through the the Red Sea. We just finished that today, and yet uh, fear was kind of kind of gripped them, no matter what they did. And and that was after you know I. I try to qualify that. That was after many years of being slaves to to other people. And if there's anything there, uh, you know, we can learn. It's, you know, if you're going to be a slave to anything, it needs to be, you know, with be a slave to God. Reminding them that the Lord will be with them to protect them, provide for them through all of what, this is from Lauren, what they are about to endure so long as they obey, so they, that they obey his will, reminding them not to repeat the same mistakes as their forefathers. And that's it exactly. Uh, that's what he's, that is the application to them specifically. It, you know, the reminding of what their parents did. And, uh, you know, as much as we, tend to think that they were condemned because they had to die in the in the desert and some of them were swallowed up by the earth and some of them died by the serpents but that doesn't mean that none of them ever came around to the under to a better understanding of God uh, but the curse was already there you know the the, the fact that they were going to die in the desert was already there which is yet another another thing that uh, another lesson for any Christian or anybody who wants to follow God can anybody want to add anything to anything that we've looked at so far okay we'll start with question six and seven which will finish out chapter one and we'll probably get into chapter two on the next one Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll dismiss. Gracious Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that we have your word, that we can read from it and hold it in our hands. And we're so thankful that your son came down, that he could deliver it to, to the world, that we may know who you are and how much you love us. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we end this, this study. Be with us throughout the week, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks so much.